G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy after one of probably the greatest finish to an AFL season we've ever seen. I still can't quite believe some of the things that unfolded in this final round of footy. In terms of the drama of some of those narratives that unfolded, was it was just unbelievable and it kind of reminded me of back in 2017 when the Eagles needed to beat Adelaide by about four goals to make the top eight on percentage. They ended up doing it in like the last minute of the game and I remember thinking, wow, that's probably the most dramatic finish to a top eight race I've ever seen. But with the three or four different games that had a massive impact on the top eight or even just had a high level of drama itself it was just scintillating stuff and I guess today I just kind of want to do a little recap of this round so it can kind of just live on as pretty much the best finish to a season I've ever seen and obviously it started off with Friday night when the Bulldogs took on Port Adelaide obviously the Bulldogs coming off a little bit of a form slump over the last couple of weeks taking on Port Adelaide who are a side that were obviously in the thick of the premiership race, but also a team that had been criticised for not beating quality sides, uh, certainly not at their home deck. But this game, in addition to being a finals audition, would also have plenty on the line. The Dogs uh, needed a win to guarantee top four, having dropped the previous two games, which is bizarre considering you know two weeks previous they were on top of the ladder. For the power, they already had top four locked up, but top two was on offer if they won this game. In addition to that, just the, the mental confidence, I guess, of beating a top team right before for the finals. Now the Dogs got out to a commanding four goal lead in the first part of this game before the power slowly started to edge their way back into the contest. They fought back hard enough to get level in the third turn before the Dogs had their own response and then they created a three goal buffer. With nine minutes to go, the Dogs held a 15 point lead in a low scoring game. This was fairly significant before Ollie Wines, the Brownlow favorite at this rate, steps up with an important goal to cut the margin to just nine points. After a couple more goals, Port would then hit the lead through none other than Robbie Gray. They would hold on for the last five minutes and to add to the drama, Bailey Smith's kick right before the siren goes, goes all the way to the goal line before getting touched through for a point. Port would hold on for a dramatic two point victory away from home against all the doubters, against all the odds. They secure top two for the second year running and guarantee themselves two home finals pending COVID. For the Dogs, bizarrely, they would find themselves still in the top four just, but they would need to wait for the following day's results between Brisbane and the West Coast Eagles. But just putting a pin in the top four race for just a moment, there was another game of pure drama that we had to endure first between Hawthorne and Richmond at the MCG. Now this game was 99% a dead rubber between two sides that almost mathematically definitely couldn't make the finals in Richmond anyway. In front of an empty MCG, the only real draw card to this game was that it was going to be the send-off for, you know, Alistair Clarkson at Hawthorne, Sean Burgoyne and Bashar Hawley for Richmond. Now it appeared there was nothing really much to see here in this game with the Hawks leading the Tigers by 31 points late in the last term. But just to add to some drama, Richmond tried to spoil the Clarkson party and they came charging hard. And when Rewalt kicked a set shot from right up against the boundary with 36 seconds to go, Richmond were only down by six points. Arts then wins a free kick in the center of the ground. He launches the ball forward, pack forms, spills to the ground. No one can get a clear possession. It's tight footy and somehow Jack Rewalt for the second time in a minute randomly swings his right leg across the ball, hits it sweetly and it trickles just over the line right in front of a diving outstretched Sean Burgoyne who couldn't quite be the hero. They review the goal, it's confirmed a goal and the game ends in a draw. I said in the boys group chat straight Straight after the game, that was one of the most incredible finishes to a game I've ever seen, but it would be barely the most dramatic thing I'd seen all day. Just on that, it would have been great to see Sean Burgoyne just get a touch on that, and it was kind of deflating a little bit to see that game end in a draw. I think even Jack Rewalt says to Burgoyne, he's like, I kind of wish you had got your hands on it. It would have been great for the Hawks to send he and Clarkson off with a win, but that's just footy, and that was an incredible comeback nonetheless. So now we pick up at the Gabba for the Lions West Coast game, remembering that the Lions need to both win and also improve their percentage by 0.1%. And I think they worked out it was going to be about four goals, depending on how high scoring the game was. Now with the form the Eagles were in going into this game, four goal win for the Lions seemed like a pretty easy task. 
But just to add to the drama, the Eagles pulled their finger out, actually played one of their better performances of the second half of the year, and made it a very tough contest for much longer than people expected. In fact, partway through the final turn, the Eagles actually found themselves just four points behind the Lions, with the Lions obviously needing about 27 or 28 points on top of what they had to make top four. Given the game was relatively high scoring, I think it became about 31 or 32 points the Lions needed to win by. So at this point, Dogs fans were probably not relaxed, but they're watching on fairly confident that they might actually finish in the top four. Realizing the need to go quick and score quickly, the Lions obviously just piled on the pressure, piled on the goals, and within the final minute, they found themselves just one behind out of the top four. After desperate surges forward, Lions had the ball in their forward line, but couldn't quite score. Then Lincoln McCarthy takes the ball, weaves through traffic, slams the ball on his left foot, and it seems to be going out of bounds and just manages to trickle through for a behind somehow. With 15 seconds to go on the clock, the Lions' only job is to prevent the Eagles going up the other end and scoring. And this was a weird dynamic here where the Lions were supercharged to prevent any kind of score, but the Eagles' season was over. They really had no horse in this race. But the Lions still managed to intercept the kick out. Charlie Cameron marks the ball, the siren goes, he kicks the goal anyway, and the Lions make the top four for the third year in a row. Now, of course, the drama wouldn't end there. There would be some post-game controversy. Someone's picked up that the umpire incorrectly stopped the clock during a Jared Berry free kick earlier in the quarter. The game went about 23 seconds longer than it should have, and thus, the Bulldogs probably should have actually made the top four on that basis. But there's no guarantees that they definitely would have. It's just one of those things where it's just, it's just footy, that's the way it goes. And at the end of the day, the Dogs had their own destiny in their own hands, and they couldn't win a game in the last three rounds to secure a top four. But it was really funny and interesting to see a game that was decided by, you know, 38 points in the end, have that sort of reaction to the last mark of the game. And the silly thing is, that wasn't even the best story or the best game from this round. Of course, I'm talking about Saturday night, Melbourne playing against the Cats at GMHBA Stadium. These two sides have a funny little rivalry. It's probably a little bit exacerbated by, you know, Caden McDonald. And I don't know if you watch his stuff, he's, he's a Melbourne fan who lives in Geelong and he's been on the receiving end of Melbourne getting pumped by the Cats for a good decade and I know these contests mean a lot to him and I think Melbourne fans generally there's a little weird kind of rivalry going on there. There's plenty to play for in this game top spot on the line and that might not mean so much you know if all the finals are at neutral venues but with Port making top two suddenly the loser of this game plays an away week one final against the power and the winner would host the Brisbane Lions at a neutral venue. Now if you just watched the first half you wouldn't believe that this was one of the games of the year. The Cats absolutely outmuscled the Demons for the first half, particularly around the sort of contested footy stakes. They kicked eight goals to one in the second term, and the game appeared pretty much over. The margin got out to 44 points. The game appeared a fizzer, and it looked like a certainty Geelong had sewn up the minor premiership. But as we should have predicted, this round had one final sting in the tail. The margin was still 34 points at three quarter time Geelong's way, and Melbourne came out kicking six unanswered goals after the final change to cut the margin to just two points. It was a tense final minute when Angus Brayshaw soccers the ball out of bounds. It's deemed insufficient intent. Geelong gets the free kick to Guthrie and appears the game's over. But of course, Geelong then respond with their own double mistake. Guthrie kicks the ball out of bounds on the full. Pretty unforgivable error, to be honest. I would have been spitting chips if I was a Cats fan. But to compound that, Brad Close thumps the ball over the fence, which you're not allowed to do if it's out of the bounds on the full. It's the same thing as throwing the ball away after a free kick. A 50 meter penalty is paid to Jake Lever. Lever is about 55 out and he has the choice with the seconds running down. He doesn't know how long's left, but it's about 30 seconds. He has the choice of going for goal, risk only getting a behind and or worse and losing the game, or he sets it up to the top of the square and hopes that a Melbourne player can mark it. And of course, who else is gonna mark it other than the skipper, Max Gorn? Now, I don't know if you remember this, but Back in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, Max Gorn had the shot in the final minute of the game to beat Geelong at the MCG, and he missed it. The Cats won that game, and then to compound that, later in the season, the Cats won after the siren, with Zach Tui kicking an amazing set shot to beat them. They broke their hearts twice that year. So there's something beautiful and fitting about the fact that Max Gorn is now having a shot after the siren for the Ds to take their first minor premiership since 1964 and beat the Cats on their home deck. Now, as you should know by now, Max Gorn goes back, he slots it, and the Ds are minor premiers 
for the first time since their last premiership. I just can't believe that happened. If somebody had written that script down and presented it to me as, you know, a screenplay, this is a great underdog story where a team reverses the fortunes that have been done to them in the past at their home deck, I would have said, that's a little far-fetched. But it was just incredible. Melbourne take the minor premiership. They avoid an away final. There was plenty to play for in the end because they avoid playing that away final against Port and the Cats now have to do make that trip. Whereas Melbourne, I think, host the Brisbane Lions at Adelaide Oval. That's still to be confirmed as I record this. I said this in another video. I'm half convinced Caden McDonald's written the script for this entire season. And when I see him next, I'm gonna have a strong word to him about why he made the Eagles suck so bad. I did wait until the end of the Sunday games, or almost the end of the Sunday games, before recording this just in case there was something else dramatic but you know the Saints flogged Frio again I was kind of torn about that wanted to finish above Frio but also have a better draft pick as it turns out we are going to finish higher so haha -ha, sucked in <laughs> But the other interesting result out of today's game is Adelaide's currently flogging north and that means the Giants hold pick two overall in the national draft because Collingwood traded away last year because they didn't need a high pick because of Nick Dacos in this year's draft and that just puts a little bow on the offseason from hell that Collingwood had last year. I mean, yes, you're right. So if they had pick two for this year's draft, they would obviously lose that in a bid for Nick Dacos, but they could still trade that for a much better deal than they got from the GWS Giants. So that one is going to sting for a bit. But anyway, guys, that was just my raw thoughts on the round that was the, probably one of the most incredible rounds of footy I've ever seen. And it just makes me so excited for the finals coming up. Usually hate the pre-finals buy. Makes me itch with anticipation, but we don't have to worry about this this year. Although we probably will have to deal with it, you know, the week before the grand final or whatever they decide. But stay tuned for heaps of finals content. Got just the tips coming out. Going to do the power rankings this week. Going to probably be doing a live stream or two this weekend as well so hope to have you all along for the ride oh and of course going to be doing season reviews for the teams that missed the finals uh going to be doing that all tuesdays so keep an eye out for that thanks guys appreciate all the support lately subscribe if you're new like the video and i'll see you in the next video